Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on the topic of the non-opioid management of pain. I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging the trust, traditional owners of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Musculoskeletal Australia wishes to sincerely thank Peninsula Hot Springs for their sponsorship of this evening's webinar, which has enabled us to offer it free of charge. It's important to state, however, that our sponsor has had no editorial control over the content of tonight's webinar. We're also very grateful to NPS Medicine Wise, which has supported us by providing our presenter for this evening. I'd like to remind you about the remaining webinars within our list of free community webinars for 2022. We still have some great topics coming up this year with shoulder problems, joint surgery, complementary therapies, and the impact of musculoskeletal conditions on intimate relationships all being covered. Remember, you can register for any or all of our webinars via our website. If you haven't previously viewed Musculoskeletal Australia's website, I strongly suggest you do so. In line with our focus on empowering consumers through education and support, we have a wide range of information, videos, webinars, tools and services, including our national helpline that's available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. Also, while you're visiting our website, check out our online shop. It has a wide range of aids, gadgets, books and other resources to assist you in your daily activities. Our presenter for this evening is Dr. Carolyn West. Carolyn is a GP and a medical advisor for NPS Medicine Wise. She has a special interest in chronic pain and lifestyle medication medicine, and throughout her career, she's been a strong advocate for a better understanding and management options for chronic pain. She is the past president of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and she's a past ambassador for Chronic Pain Australia. Carolyn is also a well-known TV doctor and health broadcaster and is currently the host of ABC TV's Ask the Doctor. Carolyn has been involved with the NPS Medicine Wise National Program on Opioids and Chronic Non-Cancer Pain, which aim to empower consumers to make more informed decisions about opioids through a suite of consumer-oriented resources. We're extremely grateful to Carolyn for presenting this evening's webinar and without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to her. Thanks very much, Carolyn. Thanks very much, Jen, and thank you very much to Musculoskeletal Australia for having me this evening. Look, this area of pain management has really been a great interest of mine for many years. And as Jen mentioned, I work as a GP. I've worked in the, the centre of Sydney in the King's Cross area for more than 30 years, but also I've worked in the last two years during COVID out in regional parts of Australia in remote regions. And that's been really interest, interesting for me to see what it's like for people living with pain in different parts of Australia. As a GP, I, I get to talk to a lot of people about what matters most to them. And again and again, I hear that those living with chronic pain in particular are really looking towards having a better way of managing their pain and to have an array of options that they can really explore that, that work for them. Pain is one of those things that's been called the silent epidemic, and it's it can be a very debilitating condition for many people. And it's one of those things that often is hard for those who don't have chronic pain to fully understand. Yet it's incredibly common. At least one in five people will be living with chronic pain. In my immediate family, some of my family members have chronic pain. And so I've, I've seen what it's like living with it, not just through the lens of being a GP, but through the lens of being a consumer myself and, and being an advocate for, for family members as well. So it, it's one of those things that as we get older, we're more likely to experience chronic pain. And women also experience chronic pain at higher rates than men for a, for a range of reasons. But what I'd like to explore today are some of the opportunities that exist for reframing how we manage pain. And that involves a deeper dive into what pain is exactly. What is chronic pain? What do we understand about it? 
And then moving through the different options for the way we think about it, management, planning, and some of the resources that you could perhaps tap into, particularly if you're in, in a part of Australia where you're having trouble getting access to services. One of the things that struck me most about my recent time working in the outback of Australia is that again and again, I heard the, the, um, the thoughts from people living with chronic pain that, look, it's really hard to access services. I really need some help here. And I guess that one of the things is to find a way of navigating through the system and to tailor your own health journey with the resources that you can use around you. And some of those resources may indeed be at your fingertips through things like the internet and through consumer resources and groups that can actually patch you in to what is available for you. But I think that it's worth thinking about chronic pain in terms of the broader picture for people. And um, it's about how we manage our pain. As I mentioned, one of the ways that I think it, it's really good to start with this whole idea of managing pain well and maximising our opportunities for living well with, with our chronic conditions is to really understand the nature of pain. And I guess that that's also, um, next slide, thanks. It's about thinking about all of the different ways that we we really understand pain to be. And as a doctor 30 years ago, our understanding of pain was fairly rudimentary. And we tended to think of pain as, as a simplistic notion of getting a, a stimulus and feeling a pain response. And it was due to always damaged tissue um, or something that needed to be fixed. Our understanding of pain has become more complex as we've understood that pain arises in a context, in a holistic context that really relates to not just the condition that may have initiated the pain cycle, but a whole raft of other things that, that really either amplify the pain or dampen it. And we'll go through some of those. But today, Musculoskeletal Australia is hosting this event along with us from MPS Medicine Wise. And it's worth remembering, as I said, that one in five people will have chronic pain. When you get to 85, it's one in four. Many of those people are actually in the musculoskeletal category. And the most common things that I see are the arthritis groups, so osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, um, osteoporosis. It's, it's really common to, to see people with ongoing back pain, neck or shoulder pain. Um, autoimmune conditions. So there are a whole range of things that can influence influence our pain. Um, next slide, thanks. So if, if we just delve into this notion of what is pain, I'll briefly just recap. Now, excuse me for those people who are watching who are actually really well versed with, with the notion of chronic pain, because I'm sure that many of you are highly educated in this sphere. But there may be some out there who this is a fairly new concept, you know, what is pain and what's acute pain and what's chronic pain. So just at its most basic, pain is, is really your body's natural warning and protective system. So you can see in this slide, there's a picture of a burning fire. So if, if we touch something that's hot, like a hot plate, very few of us are sitting around a log fire, but if we, if we touch something like the oven, for example, a hot plate, our, our body's nervous system, if we indeed have intact nerves to our fingertips, we'll sense that it's very hot and dangerous to our skin. It's going to cause damage and we immediately pull our hand away and we'll get a burning sensation afterwards. And hopefully the burn has been of a mild nature and it will heal within a matter of days. But pain as we understand it, that's ongoing pain can be a very different beast. We know that, that the experience of pain can be different for every person and it can be different according to the context in which it's experienced. But pain is real, whether it's acute pain or chronic pain. And what we've developed is a new understanding about what chronic pain is. Next slide, please. So if we think about the differences and we think about acute pain, and so as I said, you know, that, that analogy of touching something hot that you pulled your hand away from, um, you know, that's, that's a pain that starts very suddenly, tends to be short-lived. Um, it reduces or goes away as, as the healing occurs, as the burn actually resolves. Um, even acute pain can be regulated 
by your emotions or your environment or your lived experience. So for example, some people that are pretty distracted may not notice the pain of an incident or if they're in survival mode, they may not realise that they're injured because they're just focused on surviving at that point in time. They may not experience that acute pain. Chronic pain is pain that persists. Now, a lot of people get a bit mixed up with this and think chronic pain means it's worse pain or it's an exacerbation or acute pain. It's a, it's a sort of more severe pain, if you like. What we mean by chronic pain is that it's pain that persists for three months or, or more, and it's often long after the actual healing process has concluded. So we also call this persistent pain, and this can also be affected by your emotions and environment and lived experience. But the thing about chronic pain, unlike acute pain, is it doesn't follow the old fashioned rule book. It doesn't simply get better when you just treat the initial injury. And it can often linger, as I said, for much longer, um, beyond the time that we'd expect a healing process to occur. Now, the reason that this happens is that we know that brain is the, the, the brain is where we experience pain. And that actually what happens in chronic pain is you have this hypersensitive system where basically you you register the pain in, in your brain and it's almost like your whole the whole network is firing up very rapidly with this experience of pain. And this goes on and on and on. An analogy I could use is imagine that you have your car and it has a fairly sophisticated car alarm. Somebody tries to break into your car, which is the initial injury. Now that person, has, the burglar's fled and your car's still there. It's, your car's fine, nothing's happened to your car that, that warrants any further attention, yet the alarm keeps going. And this is what happens in chronic pain, that you still have this alarm system going off with this experience of pain. And it's really common to feel, oh, there must be something wrong, really wrong, that means I need to have further investigations, that it means that I should really see further practitioners. And very often this starts this cycle um, of exploration in chronic pain that doesn't always reap dividends. It can often mean that people spend a lot of time exploring opportunities for medication, surgery, and answers for curing the pain when it's really about us moving towards a system of retraining the brain, retraining the brain using a raft of management skills and techniques that can be applied that really suit you. So all of us are going to have pain at some stage. And as I said, one in five of us will experience more chronic pain um, where the brain keeps on producing the pain and we feel as though something must be wrong. So this is where it can be pretty tough having chronic pain. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, and some of the things that can certainly amplify that, that experience of chronic pain can be things like smoking. We know that people that smoke are more likely to experience more severe back pain, for example. The story of your pain also is highly influential in, in how you perceive the experience. So we know that people that have had pain that was experienced in very difficult circumstances, for example, at a difficult workplace, may have a longer period of recovery that accompanies that chronic pain. We know that sleep can be a great healer. We know that poor sleep can actually exacerbate chronic pain. And the irony there is that if you have chronic pain, it's really hard to get to sleep because it nags at you and it often disrupts your sleep. We know that nutrition also can play a role in the expression of chronic pain. We know that certain diets move towards more inflammatory markers in the system, which may heighten that, that experience of pain. We know that mental health has a big bearing on pain and it's, it's a bit like the sleep stuff, it goes around in circles. So when you have chronic pain, you may start retreating from your normal social activities. It may disrupt your work life, your financial flow, um, your self-confidence. And so all of this can have an impact on your feelings. You may find that you feel more depressed or more anxious. And the opposite works as well. The people who are depressed or anxious sometimes experience chronic pain in their bodies without having any obvious sign where it, it started at a particular point in time with an injury. It's a more general experience of body aches and pains. Now, everybody's lived through COVID in the last couple of years and COVID is going to be an interesting one to watch because 
there are some concerns that long COVID may actually um, be connected with some experiences of pain as well. So we don't know a lot about that yet, but it could be that some of the people in the next few years will actually um, be experiencing chronic pain off the back of their COVID. Next slide, please. So as, as I've talked about, you know, chronic pain is often in the context of all of these things listed in this slide. Um, we've talked about depression and anxiety, drug and alcohol use, which often can be a self-medicating response for some people where they feel pain and they think, I better have a drink to try and numb that pain. Um, employment um, can affect your exp experience of pain, even things like housing and your history of trauma. So the reason that I'm going through all of these, and as I said, excuse me if some of you are pretty across all of this, is that when you go into this understanding of what are some of the things that are affecting my pain or could be connected to my pain, it gives you a sense of, well, what are some of the opportunities to actually address my pain and to manage it so that I can live with it? And it may be that there are some of these domains that are affecting your pain more than others. And indeed, you may feel as though it's going to make a difference for you to focus on those. Um, so next slide, please. So this is um, a really great summary of the sorts of things that contrib contribute to pain. And we've, we've covered that. Um, one of the things as well is your thinking style, cognitive factors. And I will be going into one of the management strategies, which is around cognitive therapies that can help you reframe how you manage your pain. A lot of that, that movement towards psychological therapies is really around um, what is pain, how do we manage it, goal setting, acceptance, and then clear strategies that can address some of the things that can make a difference, like your sleep, um, monitoring your thoughts and un unhelpful thoughts around pain. A lot of people with pain, as I've said, start to pull back and, and in some instances, their thoughts and feelings which are natural responses to changing circumstances, can actually get in the way of them moving forward with their lives and engaging in what they want to do. So throughout this talk too, I'll be really looking at the management of pain as being around regaining quality of life, regaining function. So the aim of pain management's not necessarily about eliminating pain, because very often for people with chronic pain, their pain may go up and down. Um, it may not be eliminated altogether. In fact, going for sort of a zero, zero pain strategy may backfire because that may not be achievable. It may be more about pacing yourself, acceptance, moving towards looking at your quality of life and looking towards function. What is it that you would like to be doing that you're not doing now? And so moving the focus away from the pain in a way into a more broad context of how does your life look? How would you like it to look? Next slide, please. I think that it's really important to go back to people and, and I've spent a lot of time talking with people about their chronic pain and what it's like living with chronic pain. And NPS Medicine Wise, which is the organisation that I'm the medical advisor for, um, which you heard about at the beginning, we're a non-for-profit organisation. We really look from the consumer angle at, at health issues. Um, we look at the quality uses, use of medicine and technologies um, and we're independent. We're, we're really focusing on pain management strategies for people, for consumers, and we have a pain management hub that you can go to our website at nps.org.au and explore a lot of those resources. We also have a collection of consumer videos. And the reason I'd like to share this video with you now is that it's, it's a really, it's a wonderful way of getting insight into what it's like living with chronic non-cancer pain. So we are talking about non-cancer pain tonight. The management of cancer pain is quite a unique field, which is quite separate to what I'll be talking about now, which is chronic pain, persistent pain for more than three months. Um, and our consumers tonight in the video really um, are wonderful in sharing their stories. And I hope you enjoy this video. There are a range of other videos to, to check out as well, but this one in particular I thought was relevant to start with. So. Hello. Good, thanks. My name's Hayley and I'm 32. I've had chronic pain for 20 years now. My name is Leah Dwyer. 
I'm 57 years old. I have been living with chronic pain for about 14 years and I was dependent on opioids for eight years. My name is Gary. I'll be 57 this year. I've been living with chronic pain for around 30 years. My name is Nadine, I'm 30 years old and I've been living with chronic pain for five years. My name is Trevor Barker. I've been living with chronic pain for about 40 years. Oh, my name's Stephen Rose, I'm a proud Gundy Tamara man. I've had chronic pain for 22 years. How did your journey with pain start? How has pain impacted my life? How does my culture and beliefs impact my pain. Do you feel judged or stigmatised because of your pain? My pain started after an accident at work. I had severe scoliosis. My spine was twisted. I've had at least 20 hospital procedures on my back, including surgeries. I fell backwards at a mother's race at my son's school, and that was really the beginning of my pain. So I've had three ACL reconstructions to my right knee, which has caused uh, chronic pain through both legs. Uh, it's constant, it's a 24 seven thing. I'm in pain now, yes. It's a sharp pain, it's there all the time, only for the 24 seven. Yeah, I don't get a break from that pain, it's constantly in both legs. So I was withdrawing from relationships, withdrawing from groups that I was involved in. I can't work anymore. It affects everything I do physically, mentally. It's always in my head. Um, it's a feeling of being lost and hopeless. It's exhausting more than anything, really. I don't think people do understand what it's like to live with pain 24 seven year after year for 14 years. It is definitely um, hard <laughs> and it can be quite soul destroying and crushing and depressing and scary and worrying. Uh, and there's a lot of anger in there too. Why me? Absolutely. I felt stigmatized, um, especially when I worked at the bank. A lot of older people that, oh, if you wait till you get to my age, then you'll know what pain is. There is definitely a big aspect that you live off the system, that you just want to stay home, especially around using medication too, definitely. Being an Aboriginal, I found that I've come across stigma in the community, uh, especially at a time when I, my chronic pain was so bad that I was put on a methadone treatment. It's like they were looking for your arms to see if you had track marks. It's very denigrating. It makes you feel very low. Yep. Yep, I get put on the fat and lazy and I'd love to be working. Yeah, they're like, why is that pain still going on? Why hasn't that fixed? You've had surgery, you've taken medication, why is it better? Yeah. And I grew up out of a British uh, culture in terms of how you manage and handle feelings and emotions and you suppress them, you don't outwardly show them. And pain intensifies when you don't have good, good support. I think being Australian, we do have that mentality of suck it up, she'll be right, pat it on the back. We don't talk about our pain. Um, it, we're supposed to just get on with it or, um, you know, the Aussie way of saying she'll be right. Um, and really, lots of times she won't be right. Being Aboriginal at times has um, affected me wanting to go in and seek help. Um, often because there's a stigma with Aboriginals that they, they just want the drugs or they're going to take the drugs and then resell them on for something else. I can sort of look back at my ancestors and my elders and see the struggles they went through and realise, you know, what I'm going through is nothing compared to what they went through. So that, you know, sort of helps me a bit. Thank you. Next, next slide. So it was really interesting hearing those those stories um, of chronic pain, and they really reflect some of the stories that I hear in my surgery all the time, and the, just how difficult it is living with chronic pain, and how there's a stigma associated with for some people, and how a lot of people who have never had it don't understand it. Um, 
and there are there are some other videos on the NPS website that are really around um, how you manage chronic pain and if if not opioids then what um, there's a range on our on our pain management hub so please have a look at those if you you're interested and share them so I think that what's important to think about um, with managing chronic pain is really having this whole whole person approach and very often in the past I think we've focused on chronic pain needs a chronic painkiller in the form of a medication and that is the centre part of the the equation and we know that that is rarely the solution and in fact we now know that opioids come with a, a tremendous raft of side effects that can actually impact on quality of life and if we're looking at pain management and getting our functionality back then that is often a great barrier not an enabler so when we're looking at the whole person this will just take you through some of the the thinking there but the, the, the one that I think is the most important is focus on what's important to you so with your provider it's often your GP who's at the central central um, position in the in the care team or putting the management plan together with you um, but if it's another provider then then that person is about focusing on what's important to you so I had a, a a woman who was living with long-term musculoskeletal pain. She had severe um, uh, osteoarthritis of the knees and she um, wasn't a candidate for surgery. And she had this goal though of increasing her mobility because that had been severely in, in, impacted and the more sedentary she'd become, the more unfit she'd become. And she found it hard to walk anywhere. And so what was important to her was to be able to walk the 200 yards from her house with her two-year-old granddaughter to a local park and to be able to play with her granddaughter in the park um, just by participating and being there. So that became her goal and that was what was important to her. And through a range of measures that took some time but involved some physiotherapy, some aquatherapy, moving around the house, pacing herself so she got little bits of movement all the time. She lost two kilos, which doesn't sound like much, but two kilos off the, the knees in terms of the stress load made a big difference. And she was able to achieve that goal because that was important to her. And she did learn to walk that 200 metres and had a tremendous sense of, um, well, empowerment, being able to, to make that happen. Um, but the psychological treatments are also really important. And one thing I'd like to, to mention is that if anyone's interested in psychological treatments, but are finding it hard due to cost, due to access, that it's very hard to see a psychologist to get you help with this. There's an organisation called This Way Up, which runs out of St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. And with the pain, pain team at St Vincent's Hospital, they have put together a chronic pain management um, resource, which is a digital therapy, which you can access through This Way Up. If you go on there and you get a prescription for you from your GP, you can access that eight week course, which is a psychological treatment with a strong evidence base that it actually works. Um, I definitely recommend that. Um, so we just go back one, sorry, forward one. Okay, so focusing on, as I said, the function with the story of my, my patient who, who actually improved her function by being able to walk those 200 metres. But with chronic pain, I think this is a main goal. So one of the things that I'd like to touch upon, which is really a non-medicine based treatment for chronic pain, is mindfulness. Now, mindfulness is a type of technique where you focus your attention on your mind and body in the moment without judgment. So for example, if you were to shut your eyes and focus on your breathing and just focus on three slow deep breaths, that would be bringing your attention just to the breath. And what has been discovered is that, that therapies that help change the way you think about um, your thoughts and feelings and bring your attention to the present moment can be very powerful in offsetting the, the trauma of having to live with chronic pain. In other words, they can allow you to live with the chronic pain with a greater level of acceptance and acknowledgement 
than just if um, you don't have those techniques under your belt. So if you wanted to explore more in this domain of the mindfulness um, and, and also the cognitive therapies, um, certainly with the cognitive therapies, as I said, this way up is, is a wonderful resource. Um, both of these techniques will help to develop acceptance. As I talked to, about before with the management of chronic pain, a lot of it's not about eliminating pain, it's learning to focus on improving your function and quality of life and living with the pain and learning to manage your response to things like flare-ups and setbacks and learning to, to regulate how you process those thoughts and feelings about, about the pain. Uh, next slide. Um, it's really important to also pace yourself through the day. And I'd just like to say that a lot of us are probably feeling stiff and sore ourselves after a day at the office or a day in our chairs or a day of being sedentary. So this is a time to um, have a stretch break. And certainly um, is a preventative measure if you are in meetings or you're sitting down even watching the telly for a long period of time, a suggested move, moving session of two minutes every every 20 is, is a great way of um, improving your, your, your movement strength and uh, also a great stress reliever. So we'll just take a, a couple of minutes now with a stretch break and a, I think a message from our sponsor, is that right, Jen? Yes, that's right. Carolyn, this is um, from Peninsula Hot Springs. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steph Prem and today I'm going to take you through my stretch and release program that I've designed for the Peninsula Hot Springs. We're going to be working the entire body, focusing on both static and dynamic stretches, which are beneficial for both body and for mind. We're going to be working on the performance of your entire body whilst improving flexibility and range of motion, whilst also aiding in relaxation and stress. All you will need for this workout is a yoga mat and a positive attitude. Let's get started. Throughout this entire sequence, we want to keep a huge focus on the breath. The breath is so important when you're stretching. You want to inhale through your nose, exhale through your mouth, reoxygenating the blood, taking your hands lightly onto your rib cage, inhale that nice lateral breath out to the side, exhale as you pull the rib cage back down to your center, inhale out and exhale down as you come back to your center. That's the breath pattern we want to work on throughout all the moves. We're going to start standing nice and tall, feeling your feet grounded into the mat. Imagine you have two lines running straight up through the middle of your body, past your kneecaps, past your hips, up past your chest and out through your shoulders, standing tall with your shoulders pulled slightly back behind you. I want you to drop your chin to chest and we're going to roll down into a nice spine curl, vertebrae by vertebrae as you roll all the way down and letting your head relax at the bottom of the movement. Pulling your belly button back to centre as you scoop all the way back up to standing and just let your shoulder blades go behind you. And again, chin to chest, rolling down, vertebrae by vertebrae, really feeling it unpeel. Then I want you to nod your head yes and no, no and yes. Yes and no, no and yes. Scooping your chin to chest, belly button into your centre and curl all the way back up and roll your shoulder blades back. Then we're going to get the body moving, nice dynamic movements. Inhale as you sit back through your heels, exhale as you pull forward. Just small little squats on the spot, exhale as you pull forward, focusing on that stomach and that belly button pulling into your centre. Exhale as you come through. Once you feel yourself starting to warm up, we're going to add a calf raise. Come up onto your toes, down through your heels, back into the squat, all the way up. Getting everything moving, waking up the back chain of your body. Inhale down, exhale up. 10 to 15 of these. Thank you. 
Fantastic. So that was a wonderful way. I was stretching myself here. I thought that was a really terrific session. And um, if we can have the next slide, thanks. Um, okay. So um, what I wanted to do before I just dip into the, the final stretch of, of the talk is really to, if you are thinking of any pain management strategy, um, the choosing wisely questions certainly help you navigate the healthcare. And so when you are considering a range of therapies, be it um, medicinal, be it physical therapies, be it online therapies, just ask yourself these questions of your provider and of yourself. And it, it's a wonderful way of starting a conversation about what you really need to do that's going to make sense for you. What are the costs? What are the side effects? Um, do I really need a test or procedure? And certainly with chronic pain, it's it's very important to to consider these questions when you're navigating the system. Um, next slide, please. So as I've said, pain relief does not necessarily equal painkiller. Next slide. Um, look, the, the medicines, um, I think that one way to sort of look at it is there are a range of medicines um, that may be useful for some people. And they range from over-the-counter treatments like paracetamol and anti-inflammatories and through to the S8s or the opioid pain medications. Um, and also there has been tremendous interest in recent times in cannabis. Next, next slide. If you would like more information, because there is so much to be thinking about with the medications, you could go to our nps.org.au website for any information on individual medications and it is available there with the evidence base behind it. Just to touch very briefly though, with pain management, with chronic pain management, we're really moving away from the era, era of opioids. And the reason that I say that is that opioids have a tremendous role to play in some pain. There's no doubt about that, particularly in cancer pains, um, and, and certain other pains. But with chronic pain, the role of opioids is far less clear. And the evidence is now overwhelmingly pointing to the fact that in many instances, there are many more harms than benefits when it comes to considering an opioid. And that's why today's talk is really focusing not on the opioid group. But the reason for that, just to briefly go through it with the next slide, is that we do have an opioid crisis in Australia. Um, we've seen the, the rates of prescribing over 20 years go up tenfold. In some parts of regional Australia, the prescribing rates are 10 times higher than other parts of Australia. Now, often that's due to scarcity of services, but also patterns that, that seem to be re repeated for complex reasons. Um, next slide. And it's worth, if you are taking opioids for, for your situation at the moment is really exploring with your provider with those five questions I just went through, whether you still would be benefiting from those opioids or whether tapering down with your dose um, and actually ceasing your opioids. And the reason that I say that is that when we look at the, the pain function for most people, opioids don't improve the clinically important um, markers that we use when we look at function for most people compared with placebo, which is a surprise for a lot of people. The other thing is that when you're on opioids longer term, you can actually make your pain worse. You get this thing called a hyperanalgesia, algesia, which basically means your whole system sensitizes. This is what we see with chronic pain. And opioids can actually do the same thing, which is sort of counterintuitive because most people don't realise that. I will just move through the next couple of slides very quickly to just show you the sorts of information if you are interested in understanding more about opioids, the risks, um, 150 hospitalizations every day, three deaths a day. It's, it's a serious problem um, and there is risks of, of obviously dependency um, as well. So if we just move through those, if you are on an opioid, talk to your doctor about 
the downside of opioids and whether in fact you could review your medications um, and whether they are appropriate for you in the long term. As I said, some people, they will be the right fit, but for many people with chronic pain, the opioids are actually getting in the way of their functioning because it affects concentration, it can affect mood, make you more prone to falls, especially if you're an elderly person. So if we just move on though to one, move through the next couple of slides and I would like to just briefly touch on another area where you can find, just next slide please. One thing that, this is another video that that's really about approaches to pain management. So if you would like to see more of those videos on our website, then please go to our website and have a look at the hub. Next slide, please. A lot of people have become very interested in, next slide, this is about tapering with opioids. Once again, all of this information, if you are on opioids, is available. This is an example of what is on our website. Next slide, please. There is a big um, interest in complementary and alternative medicines um, with pain management, and many people report that they find value in certain things that they have been prescribed um, by their practitioner. It's difficult to recommend something in particular because the evidence base is lacking um, in many instances, and so it's it's very hard to tease out what benefits are actually being obtained from an active ingredient, and indeed what benefit is obtained from doing something. Um, the placebo effect is often similar to some of the outcomes that we see with um, some medications when it comes to, to pain management that are self-prescribed. And so it's very hard to tease out the evidence base. And I think that it's worth think, thinking about that some of these medications may um, have side effects. I notice in the MSK lineup that there is somebody who's going to be far more of an expert in complementary medicines towards the end of the year. So it'd be worth tuning into her podcast then. Um, the next slide, please. Um, it's hard to, to um, get by um, through a, a pain management talk without touching briefly on medical cannabis. Um, so one thing is that medical cannabis has really been prescribed more than I think 250,000 times now in Australia for more than 100 conditions, most commonly um, sleep anxiety and the big one being pain. A lot of consumer interest in this and next slide please. Um, and often it's because people argue well it's been there's been um, around for a long time, it must be safe, it must be useful and certainly some consumers are reporting that they're getting great benefit from it. However, the evidence is still coming in. So it's very hard to, to say that um, medicinal cannabis should be a first line treatment at the moment. It's not first line for any, any uh, condition in Australia, but it is available um, through special channels. And it's worth talking to your doctor if you are interested in medicinal cannabis to see whether you think it, it could be right for you. Having said that, it, it's a, it may be that like other medications which have held great promise as being the magic bullet for chronic pain, it may not be the magic bullet. With chronic pain, it is management that involves a holistic approach, the psychological, the social, the movement, the physical therapies, in addition to perhaps some sort of medication for certain people, but it's a package. I'd like to now just go to the, um, to the last the last two slides, please, um, to just look at the consumer resources um, that are available. So these are the resources um, that we can provide at NPS Medicine Wise. As I said, we're um, consumer focused, evidence based, that really help you explore some of the options that you may have. Can I go to the last two? The, the consumer resources, um, which I've just listed here, are a wonderful tool. Um, Sorry, the last couple of slides will have those consumer resources. So if you go to the consumer resources, it will have the pain management plan, um, which allows you to, to goal set. You'll be able to explore what's the latest thinking on opioids? What do I need to do to taper? What sort of questions do I need to ask my provider? I'm interested in medicinal cannabis. 
is that useful to me? You can have a look at all those resources and they've all got links to the relevant bodies to expand your skill set. So learning to manage chronic pain is really about availing yourself of, of all of these resources. There are tremendous consumer resources that are also listed on our pain management hub, which will take you into portals for organisations like Chronic Pain Australia and other organisations that have an amazing raft of places you can connect to get advice. If I can just finish up now to just say, if you are looking to, to manage your pain, um, or you could just, these are some of the resources that are just coming through now and you can go to our website and have a look at those. But what I'd like to say, you're not alone with chronic pain. It's really common, but a good management plan can make all the difference to you getting back to the things that you really enjoy in life. And, and I guess it's about moving the focus away from just trying to cure the pain, stop the pain. It's about having a big picture, if you, sort of moving out into the big picture of what's important to you, what elements of your life would you like to restore, how would, how would you best be able to achieve that. And usually it's a complex package of the physical, psychological and sometimes medicinal that will help you achieve those goals. Thank you. Thanks very much, Caroline. That was um, a very comprehensive presentation on what is a very, uh, very, very important topic and, and just a topic that is always in demand. We know with our um, consumers with Musculoskeletal Australia, everyone is desperate always for further information about pain management. And I think that that real focus uh, about that non-opioid management is so important and that holistic approach that you've outlined. Um, just out of interest, we actually had a webinar about medicinal cannabis recently uh, <laughs> in the last few years so that was that was looking at the to just as you sort of said, um, so there's there's some evidence building, but it, you know the jury's still out in relation to the value of that. So people might like to look um, at uh, at that webinar just to sort of uh, find out a bit more about medicinal cannabis. Um, and we also um, had a, a webinar in recent times, or about 12 months ago, about mindfulness um, that was really uh, fantastic. So people mm. might like to look at that but the list of resources you've got there and and certainly the NPS Medicine Wise uh, website is just an absolute uh, wealth of resources um, a, a fabulous website when we send out the recording of the webinar we can provide uh, some of these links there someone has also asked about the um, further details about this way up um, which is you know I think would be certainly uh, of interest for people to look into further. Um, so we have got some questions that have come through. If anyone has got any other questions to ask, please uh, type them in the in the question box now um, because we will be finishing uh, around pretty much on 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, there's a question about um, uh, are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories safe for long-term use? Well, there can be some side effects associated with those as well, um, particularly if people have other conditions. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that I think because people find them over the counter, they think, oh, okay, it's a neutral drug. There's no side effects associated. Um, look, by and large, they're well tolerated, but there will be people that can suffer with um, issues around exacerbating their risk of certain other conditions. So um, I think that before you go on any medication long term, uh, it's worth talking to your doctor about what your your co-risk factors are. For example, do you have heart failure? Do you have heart disease? Do you have gastrointestinal issues? Do you have a stomach ulcer? Um, do you have any drugs that may interact with them? And you know, keeping track of your medications. And if you're on more than five medications, getting a home medication review done with a pharmacist, which your GP can order, to make sure that even the things that you're buying over the counter, like your non-steroidals, are safe to take. Um, a question's come through about what medications are available that don't give bad side effects like constipation. But I, I guess part of the, your key message tonight Carolyn, is medications is only are only part of the picture. It's a matter of yeah. people looking at other the other aspects as well. 
Look, I, I think that that's one of the pitfalls of um, chronic pain management is, is this focus on, oh, I'd like to cure my pain with a pill. And you do get temporary relief from pain with certain painkillers, no doubt about it. However, the long-term issues with taking them can be profound. And as your, your audience member talked about, you know, with opioids, you've got sort of constipation and um, nausea, but you've also got brain fog and concentration issues, cognition issues, falls and overdose, um, which are really serious. So um, I'd, I'd like to say that medications, there are some that come without side effects, but pretty well everything you take apart from water um, and placebo medications, well, even placebos have side effects for some people. So they're not totally neutral. And um, it sometimes people can tolerate things like small doses of paracetamol, um, which you can buy over the counter with very few side effects. So that's probably the one that's the most neutral of the offerings. And then you move through the range with anti-inflammatories having slightly more side effects. And then you get through to the opioids. Um, there is a list of medications too there on our website that you'll have a look at that there are a whole lot of other things that are used for pain management. Sometimes amitriptyline is used for pain management, which is a you know, an old fashioned antidepressant which can block the pain signals. So there are a range of things that you can consider if, if they're right for you. Mm. And uh, someone else, Carolyn, has mentioned the fact that, you know, certain things like acupuncture or massage and so on, aquatic therapy can be mm. quite cost prohibitive. But I guess, mm. as you suggested, if people are talking with their GP and their other allied health professionals, um, you know, together with that health professional, they'd be able to work out a plan that's manageable and accessible, I guess, for them within the resources that they have. Oh, look, I, I feel for people. I think that physical therapies are really unaffordable for a lot of people, even if they've got a GP management plan where they get rebates on five sessions. So if you have a chronic condition for more than six months, you qualify for that. But it's only a bit over $50 back in the rebate. So you're often $50 out of pocket at least. Um, I think it's about being creative, talking, getting online to the, some of the online groups, some of the forums on chronic pain and finding out what um, is in your area that's for free. Um, there will be some free council run aqua aerobics, for example. There'll be park run, which people can do as a park walk if they don't really want to run, but they just want to sort of toddle along. There are plenty of sort of free activities within your council, even starting with your local council, to find things that are affordable, because if they're not affordable, they're not sustainable. Mm, mm, exactly right. Um, someone sort of said that uh, they have had relief uh, in relation to their pain when it's been quite severe from um, a, a TENS machine, a, tr a transcutaneous mm. electrical nerve stimulation. I'm not sure if I ever knew what that stood for. Um, and the question is just, have you had any experience of TENS machines? Oh, look, you know, I used to get people to use TENS machines years ago and was a bit of a fan, but I've, you know, I've had to adjust my thinking on it only because I think the ev evidence is patchy. I'm, I'm not convinced that they make a big difference for a lot of people. You know, having said that, if an individual person is finding that something brings them enormous relief, um, then if, it, if it's without side effects that are impacting your life, then, you know, a lot of people are free to choose that that path. It may work for them. Um, there are a lot of things that we're rethinking. PRP injections, you know, those ones that that uh, are from blood or plasma injected into tendon issues that are, are painful long term. Um, there's no strong evidence base there either. Like there there are quite a few things out there in the marketplace that are available, but it, it's hard to sometimes back it up with with a true kind of evidence base that, oh yes, this works for a, a great number of people. Mm. And on the issue of cost, we've actually had some good suggestions coming through from people. The Heart Foundation walking groups are free mm. and, and are available um, throughout Australia. Um, someone said a good quality heat pack has worked very well for them. And also someone has suggested the Rebuild Program Facebook group for Lady, you know, so there's a there's a range of things if people can look around and I'm sure the NPS Medicine Wise uh, uh, website has got some suggestions and, and also our musculoskeletal uh, helpline, uh, people can always ring that to sort of um, find out what uh, resources might be available at low cost. 
Um, another question was, uh, someone has asked about how do you manage acute pain when you have chronic pain? This person has an operation mm. coming up, so is hoping to avoid opioids. Mm. Well, certainly we're moving towards trying to not prescribe opioids in a hospital setting, in EDs and after theatre, because we found that that's often the slippery slope to dependency. People leave hospital with a script just in case, inverted commas, and then next thing they've used it for a week or two and they've actually become a little dependent and expectant on it. So talk to your, your doctor early about that you wish to use a non-opioid um, approach. And it's fantastic that they're asking that question because you know there are other ways of pacing yourself using paracetamol, heat packs, moving. Um, there are all sorts of things that can actually help manage that pain in the short term. Mm. A person has joint instability, um, but there, there's uh, surgical interventions not recommended, but there's free subluxations or dislocations. Um, are they classified as chronic pain? I suppose it depends on their, their experience. It totally, and it gets back to what I was talking about before, that, that chronic pain is really your experience of pain. There can be a whole range of reasons why you have that pain. Some people don't have a definable moment that it started with a sense of trauma or a condition, it just appears. So um, if you experience chronic pain, you've got chronic pain. If you experience it for more than three months. Mm. And um, of course, someone's mentioning the fact that the um, GPs prescribing opioids uh, has become a bit more restricted or certainly the over-the-counter availability and so on. Um, how would you recommend a patient is able to access adequate pain relief, including well, I suppose, again, that's your whole message. There's no doubt through some of the questions coming through, there is definitely that focus on, as you say, taking the painkiller, taking the pill, uh, when mm. you're advocating tonight, Carolyn, a, a broader view with regards to how to manage pain. Certainly, and I think that it's, look, I think everybody in pain just wants something that's going to alleviate their, their discomfort because it's such a, a horrible thing to live with. I get that. But if we're looking at the big picture, getting back to what's your quality of life like? What's your functioning like? Can you think? Can you get out the door? Can you do all of these other things if you're on opioids? Are you at risk of actually having side effects of opioids that could mean that you accidentally overdose, particularly if they're in combination with other opioids? It's not uncommon for people to be on a bunch of stuff that they're, they're putting together. I think that it's worth talking to your doctor about if you are on opioids, um, you know, what are the benefits for you? Now, there may be benefits for some people, but really exploring, would it be worth tapering and giving it a go coming off? And if somebody's got questions about that, I, I glanced through the slides, but there are some terrific resources on nps.org.au that take you through that, that give you a sense of, oh, I sort of get this now. This gives me a good conversation starter with my GP to at least have the conversation. You might not come off them, but at least you've broached the subject. Mm. Well, look, we're just right on 8, 8 p.m., um, so we will finish up there. Carolyn, look, thanks so much for giving of your time, energy and expertise in presenting this evening. It's been most informative. I'd like to thank again NPS Medicine Wise for um, uh, supporting us in, in having you as a speaker. I'd also like to very much thank Peninsula Hot Springs for their sponsorship of tonight's webinar. And I, as I've said before, the recording will be sent out and we'll be sending out a lot of these links and make sure that people um, can gain the information that they need to then maybe discuss it with further with their GP and certainly look into the, the whole topic of um, the non-opioid pain management uh, much more thoroughly. So look, on um, behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, thanks, Carolyn. Thanks everyone for joining and feel, please fill in the exit survey, which should come on your screens now. So I bid you all a good night.